Good morning everyone, I'm TJ and today I will talk about linear buckling using NX SOL 105. I will use an example from Pavel Goncharov's book Engineering Analysis with NX Advanced Simulation in uh, part 2 section 2.1. Uh, you will learn how to set up and run SOL 105, which is very simple indeed. And then I will show you how to apply the buckling load and the boundary conditions. And I will talk about the limitations with SOL 105, which is the reason why I also will post a video describing nonlinear buckling using SOL 106. SOL 105 is a linear solver, that means it uses buckling modes to predict the critical buckling load. And SOL 105 can only include or consider small displacements. You can't have large displacements because that will change your stiffness and that will change the modes, the buckling modes as well. You must have linear material behavior. You can't have loads which are so high that it, they cause plasticity in the structure. You can't uh, predict post buckling because you can all only consider the maximum uh, critical load. What happens after the critical load has occurred is not possible to solve in SOL 105. And you can only uh, include conservative loads. That means you can't have follower loads, which uh, follows uh, the deformed structure. So why run this NX SOL 105 solver? Well, first of all, it's easy to set up and run and it gives you a good critical buckling estimate although it's uh, an overestimation and that's why I will post the SOL 106 nonlinear buckling um, solution for you and the SOL 106 can include all these effects but let's check how you can run a linear buckling analysis uh, based on Pavel Goncharov's example here is the strap model from uh, Pavel Goncharov's book and uh, the first thing we have to do is to go to the application pre and post and then we create a uh, new FEM and simulation and I'll create an idealized part and then I choose SOL 105 linear buckling and I think I can use the default parameters for case control. Um, I'm using or requesting only 10 um, modes, so that's the default value, so I don't have to do anything else. Uh, I can, of course, um, call the solution linear buckling. Okay. Then I'm opening my idealized part file which has to be promoted in order to edit. And here I use the mid-surface by face pairs and I select the solid model and I want to hide the solid upon the application of the mid-surfaces. Okay, so here we have the shell. And then I'm opening my FEM file and I don't want to see the solid model so I remove it and I only have my mid-surface model here and then I do a 2D shell mesh of this one and I use an element size of 3 millimeters sequel 4 elements are okay and the paver measure and this is my model then I have to go to the collector and I have to edit my shell property um, I use, I didn't specify the material on the geometry model, so I select steel here for my collector, which is the same material as Goncharov proposed, and then a uh, recommended thickness or a thickness of 4 millimeter, which is actually not the same thickness as the basic solid, but I follow the example from the book. I can give this the name 4 millimeter. Thin shell property, 4 millimeter. Uh, then uh, my model should be ready and I will open my simulation file 
And here I want to first apply the boundary conditions. Constraints. New constraint, fixed constraint, and I choose the inner edge here. And then I apply the buckling load and I use new load force and I use the inner edge here as well and now I have two options I can either uh, specify a force which I think is close to the buckling force or I can do it another way I can simply use a force amplitude of 1 because then the calculated eigenvalue will actually be my buckling load. If I specified um, a force here which was uh, 1000 newtons, uh, my eigenvalue would be the factor which I had to multiply with this force amplitude. But when I use the force here equal to 1, the eigenvalue will directly be my critical buckling load. And then I had to specify the direction and I use two points this is the from point and this is the to point. Let me capture the center here. There we are. Okay. Okay. Uh, then I want to visualize it a little bit different. Edit display. I want to use expanded and scale this. And there we are. Now we see the buckling and load and the direction. So now my model is ready to run. So we go to the solution linear buckling and we say solve. And now it's completed. And then we go to the structural results. And let's check what we got. Uh, first, we have the buckling loads, the displacements, stresses and things like that. But actually, the displacements um, is just a relative issue here, because um, the buckling uh, modes, they are scaled. And um, they don't give you any information about the amplitude or the strains and the stresses. Uh, you have to run an SOL 106 solution in order to predict the strains and stresses during the incremental loading of the buckling load. So the only thing which is of interest here is actually the modes, the buckling method modes. So here we can see that the lowest mode has a value, an eigenvalue of 3031 newtons. Actually, this eigenvalue is the critical load. So you can see the first critical load is 3031 newtons. The next one is 27229. But you know that if you apply this compression load, you will never reach this mode because the system will buckle according to the first mode. And it looks like this. Let's animate it. So uh, directly, since I used the force amplitude of 1, uh, this eigenvalue is the critical buckling load. But as I said earlier, we are using a linear solver and this buckling load is just an estimate. It's an overestimate of the critical buckling load. So uh, this shouldn't be used in order to design uh, real structures. So this concludes my presentation on of the linear buckling. It's an easy solution to run, but I recommend you to watch my other video uh, showing nonlinear buckling in NX, which give you more precise results. Thanks for watching.